Hey y'all, happy baby Friday. Um, we are here for another healthcare happenings. I am pleased to have my good friend Saul here to do our, oops, sorry, I gotta turn my sound off over here, to do our uh, second part of our e for 2021 slash 2023 updates. So we've got some more questions and some more resources through and stuff I'll be putting up in the resource in the comment section for y'all so that you can see it. And uh, I also have a, a surprise added special guest, our good friend Beth uh, with Advanced Coding Services. And I brought Beth on because Sonal and I in uh, June are going to be in San Diego to speak at her retreat that's on mastering the business of medicine and it's going to be super cool. So I just wanted to have Beth on so we, she could talk about it a little bit so that it made people aware of something that's out there. That's fabulous networking, nice and relaxed. And so if y'all have some questions, you can go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, but uh, Beth, first of all, thanks for taking some time to come on today. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Thanks. And so, so people that don't know you, and I see we've got people coming on in, in y'all that are coming on. I, oh, Ladriba, hey, Ladriba, how you doing? And Haley, Pam, Pam Vanderbilt's on, ladies. So, awesome. um, hey, Pam. if you have questions for Beth as we're having this, this first little discussion, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll have Beth answer them for you. Or if someone and I, um, you know, know the answer to it, of course, we'll jump into. Um, but Beth, for people that aren't familiar with you and the company, like how did you get started in healthcare and doing what you're doing now? Um, so way back in the day, I, um, I was hired as a receptionist for an internal medicine doctor. Um, and I was there about three weeks and the office manager and he got into a fight and she walked out and he said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, do you know anything about billing? And I said, nope. <laughs> and he goes, I'm sending you to school. Will you learn? Yep. And so um, the rest is history. I've been doing this about 27 years. So I started when I was two because I'm not yet 30. Of course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been doing this a long time. Um, in full disclosure, I'll tell you, I've been doing this longer than my son has been alive. And he's just turned 25 last month. Um, so it's been a day or two, um, and I just love it. I, I own my own billing service, and I love servicing our doctors and providing for them. Um, but then there was that next step of helping the next generation of builders and coders. And, you know, we were we were an extern site for those big box schools. Um, and so we would have we would have externs come in and oh my goodness, I was like, you guys don't know Jack Dilly's squat and you're paying thousands of dollars for this. Um, so one of my goals was at some point to open my own billing and coding school where I could teach them and teach them correctly, where they could have a career, an actual career where people would want to hire them. Um, and so we have advanced coding services and we do, you know, if there is a, a curriculum out there from APC, we can teach it. Um, look me up. I have about 12 credentials. Um, and so if I have a credential after my name, I can teach that. And we do. Mm -hmm. My goal is really to help people grow and to stretch themselves and um, and to give them a career that they can get started and where they can feed their families. Um, and so that's what we do. And then now that we teach you coding and we give you that, we help you get your certificate so you're certified, what's the next step? Now you're floundering to get CEUs. And so we have a membership, but then it just kind of evolved. And I just had this epiphany one night. Literally, I'm not lying to you. I was laying in bed. I was trying to go to sleep. And this idea just came to my head. It was a just kind of a brainchild. Um, and I just could not sleep until I completely mapped the whole thing out. About one o'clock in the morning, I completely mapped it out. And I fell asleep and woke up the next morning with, we are doing a coding retreat. Because this is where we get to sit with the Sonal Patels. We get to sit with the Betty Hovies. You know, we've all been to HealthCon where there's thousands of people and Betty, you did a great presentation, but I had questions that I wanted to ask and I couldn't get to you because the line was 50 deep and I had to get to my next session and so do you, and I couldn't see you again. And so yeah. this yeah. is where we get to sit with you. 
right. um, we have breakfast, we have lunch together, we are in class together. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities for networking, card games, we might have a beach night, we might have a bonfire. Um, but this is where we're all just grouped together and it is intentionally small. Um, I think I think in San Diego, because that's what we're talking about, San Diego, our retreat in San Diego, we're limited to 85 attendees. You know, HealthCon has like 3,000 people. Our retreats are limited to 85 attendees because it's intentionally small. It's intended to be intimate. It's intended to be where I can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. We talked a little bit um, just a few minutes ago, and now we're going to add a brand new panel. Uh, so you want to be a consultant. And we have all kinds of people. We have Betty. We had we have Sonal. We have Pam Vanderbilt, Branda Edwards, Ruby Woodward, um, big names in the consulting world. Uh, Christine Hall. We're there. We're all going to be there, and we're going to have a panel. We'll we'll work out the logistics, but we're going to have a panel. Like maybe I want to be a consultant, but I don't know how to get started or where. And you guys are going to talk to us about that. Um, we also have a professional photographer coming in that's going to do headshots. If that's something people are interested in. You know, upping their game. So, no, you're going to talk about branding and marketing your own brand. And so, we're going to talk about that. And then we'll have photographers doing headshots so that um, people can just grow and expand. And sometimes it's, I don't know where to start. And this is getting mm -hmm. that starting point, talking to industry, the industry experts about how did you get started? Betty, talk to me. I want to be you when I grow up. How did you get started? <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about, right? Right. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of the intent. Oh, and I'm wearing the shirt. Um, because we're, we're all going to be in shorts and T-shirts. In mm -hmm. full disclosure, I probably truthfully will be in a T-shirt and skirt because that's what I'm comfortable yeah. in. Right. You wear what you're comfortable in. I tell my students, as long as all your parts are covered, I don't care mm -hmm. what you wear. And I don't Cover care what you wear. Bits. Cover your naughty bits. That's mm -hmm. right. Cover the bits. Mm -hmm. um, you can wear flip-flops. You don't have to have your hair done. Because there's no judgment. There is a this is a judgment free zone. I don't care if you're not business casual. You're at the beach. You're intended not to be business casual. Um, this is where you're just going to have those questions. And maybe I'm too shy to be in a room of a, a thousand people at another conference. Um, but I have my own questions. And so maybe I accidentally walk next to Brenda Edwards or Pam Vanderbilt or Betty. Um, maybe I'm just accidentally walking next to you, and we can have that conversation as we mm -hmm. walk to lunch together. Um, I can get my questions answered and I don't feel self-conscious about asking it in front of a room full of people. But yeah. I might now ask you that question um, and then you're like, oh, and so when we go back from lunch, now you're like, oh, hey, by the way, don't forget we said X, Y, and Z and, you know, I, somebody brought to my attention and so I just want to make that announcement for everybody to know um, so that those questions are getting answered so that we are really speaking into the lives of these billers, coders, auditors, healthcare professionals um to grow their their personal brands to grow who they are and so that's really kind of the the brainchild of this is to just um to speak to these 85 people in san diego great and i i just put the link that i had on the screen i put it in the chat for everybody so they can look at it and um the other thing i made this new little thing for it uh, what I think is great when you look in the middle there, you know, about what's included in the retreat, you know, so all the lodging, all your meals, all the sessions. So, you know, mm -hmm. the fee that you're paying is the fee for everything, everything, uh, unless, you know, you're doing extracurricular things in San Diego, you know, after hours. Um, but, you know, all of that other stuff is is bundled in there. There's no extra out of pocket costs, you know, and of course, arriving there, whichever way you, you know, are going to get there. Um, but other than that, everything's all covered and you don't see that anywhere either. And I think that that is just a fantastic thing to well, do it that way and bundle it. Exactly. Right. And, and that's, that was part of the thing. Like sometimes these other retreats are just cost prohibitive for just our, our typical coder. I mean, if your employer isn't sponsoring you to go, mm -hmm it's cost prohibitive for the person who's just trying to work to make ends meet. And I mm -hmm. didn't want to gouge people. I want to offer a great thing. Lady's going to be there. Lady was there last yeah. year. She had a ball. Yay. Um, Perfect. But hey. I would say, hey, lady. So I, I just want everybody to be aware that we're going to be on the cliffs. If you can see my screen behind me, that's literally a picture from our, from our venue. 
Um, oh, oh wow! You're going Great. to be on the cliffs. You Great. you will look at the at the in our in our room, and then the whole wall is just window because you, all you see is ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so amazing last year. <laughs> so so many people were cold we had to shut the windows from the ocean breeze <laughs> it was um, it was absolutely phenomenal um so just be prepared i mean bring a jacket bring a sweatshirt because that ocean breeze is beautiful but it gets a little nippy yes uh, it does so we're on yes. the ocean yeah so. oh good so um uh if anybody's got any questions for pam uh on the retreat make sure you pop them into the comments uh, and to our chat real quick before Pam has to scoot. Um, uh, uh, Cause I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing any people just making, of course, Pam has a winning. A winning, um, that's cute. <laughs> so oh, uh, as we give people a couple minutes in case they do have questions, um, some of the sessions, like you said, someone's doing one on branding Right. So it's also doing one on auditing under auditing the new guidelines, standards. right? So yep. What are the new audit standards for 2023 and beyond? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm doing uh ENM ninja coding training. So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna work cases and uh play. I, I designed an ENM coding game. So we're okay. gonna play that game huh. and do things so it's very hands-on to where you can work things, ask questions, talk to each other. Um there's gonna be presentations on denials and right. risk adjustment, right? Risk adjustment, right. right. And no surprises act. act. What? And no surprises act. Right. Mm -hmm. Where's the gift in the No Surprise Act? Where's so the well, gift? Oh, cute, clever. About that. Yeah. Um, I have a really dear friend of mine. He's a retired Marine. He's going to come talk to us about uh, leadership and teamwork. Um, oh, nice. So I'm really excited for that one. That um, he will be our opening session on Saturday. Uh, talk working and why it's important and why we should do it. Um, and then we have Pam Vanderbilt, and she's going to talk about e &M. We have Brenda Edwards, and I think she's going to talk about Incident 2. And how that plays a role with the new E&M guidelines. Um, uh, Christine Hall, I can't remember what she's speaking on, but Christine is going to be with us. Um, the dates are June 9, 10, and 11. Um, Check-in is Friday, June 9th, about 4. Our first session starts at 6.30. Um, and then we will be all day Saturday. And then all day Sunday, we're done 4.30 Sunday night. Um, Saturday, dinner is on your own. But I'm not, I mean, we kind of had some moments last year of people running to the border. If you want to go, y'all go to Mexico, but bring your passports. I don't carry bail money. So uh, <laughs> kind of on your own there. Um, um, but we had people who went to and did a bonfire on the beach. We had people who went and had a nice dinner in San Diego. We had people who just ordered pizza and stayed in the room and visited with, with each other. Um, we also have card games and puzzles and stuff so that there's activities to do. Nothing is organized after the classes. It just all happens organically because mm -hmm. suddenly we're best friends. We're on a retreat. We're hanging right. out. We're just visiting. Right. And suddenly we we're best friends for, for the last three days. Cool. Cool. All right. Love it. So Love it. Um, thanks, Beth, for giving us some of your time today. So y'all, once again, if you're interested, uh, make sure you go uh, take a look in where I put the um, link in there for you to advanced coding services so that y'all can check it out and sign up and register so that you can be among those that are hanging out with us uh, in June in San Diego. So um, thanks a lot, Beth. I'm glad you could take some time thanks. with us. Well, thanks for having me. It was great to see you gals. And we so will see you see in you. about 60 days. Yes. Absolutely. Ooh. Love it. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. That was so nice that wow. she could come on. She um, was incredible, right? And telling everybody out there about this retreat. It's an amazing concept. So hopefully our yeah. listeners um, know what to do now. Just go ahead and sign up. Yeah, and Haley um, made a comment that she can't make it this time. But and this is something just so okay. that y'all know that is a repetitive. Like she's having one in Georgia um, in a couple weeks, and then there's one in San Diego. So she's doing them. Um, they'll be on the. Oops, sorry. They'll be um, regional, you know, in nature. So if you go to the Advanced Coding Services site you can she'll start listing where the next ones are going to be right. uh so that you can see where they're coming um 
All right. Oh, Ladriva, that was so nice. Yes. Um, she's she's great. So um, we'll look forward to um, to that. Um, oh, and Gabri Gra Grabiella um, is uh, going to try to join us. So that would be good. Wonderful. We'll be happy. Great. And Sonal and I both um, were, I'm going to do a healthcare happenings live from there. And I think Sonal, you said you were going to do a, a podcast live from a there podcast too. podcast live from there too. So, yep. you know, we'll be Absolutely. doing some live stuff. So that'll be That's right. too, that, that y'all can join in on. Mm -hmm. All right. Now to the business of the stuff we wanted to talk about today, our e &M part two. So, um, in looking at from the last time we we um, did our first part for this, the AMA came out with their errata and technical corrections and things like that um, for the e &M changes and the guidelines. And um, they also have some FAQs and some different things that uh, Shonal kind of sent over to me. And so I will, again, put links to all of those over in the uh, chat box here so that y'all can go ahead and take advantage if you don't have them of going in and seeing all of them. Um, the first one that I'll put up in there is the FAQs and I labeled each one of them. So when you get them, you can see like the one I just put in there says it's the AMA, CPT, e &M, FAQ. So you'll know which one it is that you're going in to look at. Um, so we have the FAQs and then we also have the, uh, oh, no, did that one. Then we have the errata and technical changes. Now that, um, when you look at that one, it's not only for the e &M, it's also for anything else in CPT where they miss something. So it's about what, five or six pages long, I think, Sonal. Um, That's right. And it's about they seven. go through yeah. like the other sections of CPT if there's like verbiage mm -hmm. that they needed to clean up or something like that. So it's anything like that when they say it's the technical corrections. Sometimes it's like in the E&M, for example, one of the corrections was they changed the word immediate to intermediate because they they put it in there wrong. So sometimes it's just a little thing like that, but they, you know, want to make it correct. So that that would be like a technical correction um, that they were making in there. And then the third thing I'm going to be putting in there is from a webinar that they had um, that is called um, Advancing Landmark Updates Across More Settings of Care. That, that sounds really confusing, but <laughs> it had, again, um, a lot of questions and answers that had come in um, during the, the presentation. So these are the Q&As that the presenter went through during the session, right? So am I That's getting right. all those right, right? Yep, yep okay. exactly. So all of those... All of those links are now over in the chat so that y'all can go ahead and pull them up as you're as we're going through things or later, you know, you can have them to refer back to if you want to go look, because obviously we don't have enough time to cover every single thing that was in there. Um, but I, I kind of picked out a couple that um, I thought we got a lot of questions on, you know, personally, both of us and some of them where I think that the AMA um, misinterpreted maybe the question that the person was asking, um, again, due to the questions that we get. So, uh, just wanted to kind of, on a couple of them just say, well, don't forget about this or remember, or, you know, if this was the question instead kind of thing. So we're just going to go through some of them that were in there and talk about them. And then we did get some questions from people. So we will pull those up and go through those. And then if y'all have any questions, you know, make sure you go ahead, uh, any additional questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll see what we can get to in the time that we have remaining. So, um, see, my first one that I pulled in was, uh, should the coders determine whether a patient's medical problem or illness is stable or worsening? Um, and I'm glad the question was asked because I know sometimes the coding professional, when they're looking at records, they sometimes know their docs, right? And they know their NPs, the PAs, and they're there every day with them. And they'll look at the record 
and say, well, uh, well, this is what we're meaning. This is this is what they 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 meant when they put this in there. Or um, back in the days when we had the handwritten chart, <laughs> I you know, and, and the whole joke like song you put up in LinkedIn that one Friday with the scribble and it's yep. you know the yep. doctor writing something. Yeah. Um, you know, those things were you could give notes to another office from your doctors and they would have no clue what they said they could give you notes from their doctors again no clue what they said but mm -hmm. you reading it because you're used to this chicken scratch right you would say oh well yeah this says this 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 right. you know um and so it got to a point sometimes with some of them it was a disservice mm -hmm. because you knew what it said but if the record got asked for from a payor, you know, and they got that chicken scratch, you know, they were like, mm, nope, you know, I don't know what yeah. that is. It's nothing, exactly. you know, so it turned out not to be the greatest thing to, you know, be able to make those leaps too much. Right. Do you remember that? that those of things? Course, of course I do. The chicken scratch, of course, of course. Yeah. So when we, you know, hear questions like this, it gives us pause, right? So even though we are friendly, we think we understand our doctors and our PAs, et cetera, and what they intend on their scribble or what they intend in a documented note, it is, it is not our job as coders to determine anything about the patient's condition, right? It has to be clearly documented in the EMR system today, right? There should be today in 2023, much fewer chicken scratch yeah. um, throughout the country. So yeah, it literally has to be typed in there by the doctor, the PA, whoever is in charge of that note. Um, we have no place in making an assumption, absolutely zero. So that's how I would answer that question. Yes. Um, it's kind of harsh, but we have absolutely well, no right to yeah. assign that kind of a judgment. No. Yeah, you're you're kind of uh, diagnosing the patient yourself then. So yeah, we're, we're and practicing we, medicine without a license. Yeah, right. I mean yep. you're, you're yep. stepping out of bounds there. Um, right. And you know this is the way that it was answered. No, you know a coder should not determine whether that problem is stable or worsening the patient's physician or other QHP, which is qualified healthcare professional is expected to determine that. And that's one of the places in the assessment and plan or impression plan, whatever y'all call it in your practice that, you know, I found that we have to keep touching the um, uh, physicians and APP in that, you know, you have to state that, you know, I right, and right. stating that may raise the level to mm -hmm. an appropriate level. Right. Um, and I say may, because remember, we have three elements, you do have to meet two of them. So just because your problem addressed is high doesn't mean you have a five, That's just right. because it's worsening and, and exacerbated chronic doesn't mean it's a four, you know, exactly. you have to have one other piece that matches. Right. But if they just put that it's psoriasis and it's a chronic condition and that's it, you, you, you can't make the leap there. We have to right. see that there's evidence that it's not at goal, it's flaring, it's worsening. So um, when I when I talk to my docs and APPs, I would always tell them, use your words. Yeah, <laughs> like when you talk, you know, so you have to use your words. Adjectives yeah. are your friend when you get to the assessment and plan or impression and plan and putting that stuff down. But I think back in the day, um, you know, because it was so heavily looked at with a lot of practices would uh, rely on the history and the exam to get their level. Right. And so they really didn't pay too much attention to what they put in the assessment plan. Exactly. Sometimes I would get a very short assessment plan and these exactly. big long histories and exams because they said, well, right there. So I can just put come back in six months and it's okay. You know, um, and that habit is hard to get out of once you get into it. Truly. But, you know, I, I have been saying this for a long time since the new guidelines have come into play, right? 
we need to get our doctors and APPs back to what they were trained on, right? That clinical decision making is theirs. And we want that to be celebrated in this new style of documentation, right? Gone should be the old days of, you know, just blowing up that history and exam for those bean counting points, right? We want them to get out of that bad habit that has formed. And you're right. It's like smoking cigarettes, right? It's, it's a terrible habit to just break. It's really, really hard. Um, but that's what we do in this field is we try and provide the education that we know their thoughts are up there. We just want them put into the EMR. Um, all of that brilliant thought process on, you know, why this patient is so sick, put that down and what we can do to help them get better, right? What kind of tests do you need? What kind of surgeries can we perform, right? We have to have that entire linear thought process um, happen throughout the EMR. So yeah, a lot of changes, right, have to happen because of these new CPT code guidelines and definitions, for sure, for sure. I don't think we're there yet. Um, yeah. We have a ways to go, um, but slowly but surely we will definitely see improvements in the way things are documented from specialty to specialty. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of them have more advantages with the new changes, um, but all of them have to jump on board. Yeah. And, and, and speaking when you, when, when we were both, when I said it and then when you said it too about the books and pages and all of that history and exam stuff in there, please stop doing it. Y'all <laughs> you don't, I still see every time I audit, every time I look at records, I'm still seeing, you know, three pages of history and exam in there. I mean, it, it's just not necessary anymore. It's so not necessary. And, and I do believe that's where we really have to, get involved however we can insert ourselves into um, assisting with the EMR changes in their templates that have to be changed, right? Because when you and I go in and look at these records, we're looking at the EMRs and we're like, wait a minute, that was from years ago. Nothing mm -hmm. has changed, right? Because you and I have been around the block and these EMRs all still look the same, right? So it's that same templating that has to be done away with and something yes. new has to um, reveal itself because that's the only way we are punishing our providers, right? And saying, oh, but you keep doing this. Well, they're not doing it. It's the EMR that's been constructed for them mm -hmm. to continue with these endless, you know, histories and endless exams of every single part from head to toe that's unnecessary for the patient's presenting problem, right? They only came in for something very small. They don't need a head to toe exam for anything like that um, at all. So yeah. yeah, there's so much that needs to be worked on. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and, and y'all that are listening to, I'm, I'm happy to hear y'all thoughts on this. I, I think some of that template hanging around stuff is because um, you know some of the EMR systems they say that used to be one of their big things we have a thousand templates and That's they're they all said. in there for you to use right That's what they said. you yes. can take use of all, but then you would go into those templates and they were not the best templates sometimes no. and so they would spend extra money either to consultants like us mm -hmm. or to the EMR company to build them templates to their specifications. Right. So since they paid for them, it was a lot yeah. of money. I understand. Yeah. And so I, I think maybe that's where some of it comes from where they don't want to give it up, you know, to where they continue to use them. Cause it's like, I paid a lot of money for the, but it's just wasteful. It's wasting it's their wasteful. time. It's, yes. you know, it, it's yes. just, keeping up with that just bloated over information stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, change the, um, oh, that's a good idea. Uh, change, change what they're doing, you know, to just, you know, bypass the stuff. It's just not necessary. It's only what's medically appropriate for that visit. Uh, right. Teresa had a, a, a good comment here. 
if we could just get providers to use the AWV templates and the IPPE templates, you know, for certain kind of visits, um, the annual wellness visit, the um, welcome to Medicare, the IPPE, um, that's not a bad idea to kind of look at those uh, for some ideas on how to use your new ones. Um, but the annual wellness visit and the IPPE, again, you know, are specific, specific kind of things and they don't address some, like one of them right. doesn't really address problem things. It's not a problem visit. Right. So, um, but yeah, looking kind of, uh, it, it would definitely be moving away from at least having to click 50 times to get through, you know, the first page of the patient's template. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it really, you know, needs to be looked at. Um so that is just my comment on that is 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 i know that they've spent a lot of money on them in some cases but they're really not doing them any justice anymore um they they should uh you know just stop just stop and it would make them right. easier and make it easier for them they'd be happier they'd be getting through it better mm -hmm. um and then in the old templates there might be some of that stuff missing in the medical decision making absolutely absolutely you know, so um, Elizabeth has this comment that it's ridiculous to see templated notes. It should be easy for providers to document what they did on the data service. You know, um, there should be a way to fix that. Um, yeah, the, the, the way to fix that, um, Elizabeth, is, is to just turn the templates off and right. you know, allow the free text. Yes. You know, um, yeah. but again, we go back to the habit thing. Right. Yep. So yep. they're used to the templates. And yep. so now if it's free text and they're having to go back in and starting to enter this information again, they still have those big note things in their head, I think. And they're thinking, oh, I have to do all the No, no why is, don't need why to. is the patient right. there? Right. Simple. You know, simple. Mm -hmm. what, what part of the exam did you have to do? Or a lot of them nowadays, we see a lot more scribes being used. So mm -hmm. if you have a scribe, you know, they're doing all that. They're, stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Another point, Teresa, she still sees uh, that greater than yes. 50% of the, the counseling. Time. Yes, yep. for sure. Yep. It's still in there. That sentence needs yes. to be gone. Yeah. Yeah. God. So she and, and so these are kind of like the little things we're talking about when when you start talking about the new mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. it people just weren't thinking of these things. And now that they're actively doing these over and over, it's kind of like, well, why is that still there? And why is it, you know, yeah. um, it, it looks like you're not um, attentive mm -hmm. to being compliant. You know, when, when, when it's like that, it's just kind of like slopped together. Yes. Uh, at least that's kind of how I, if I was a payor looking at it, that's kind of where I would go in my head. Do you Absolutely. agree? Absolutely, 100%. When, when I provide post-education, those are things that I say, right? That I'm auditing your services because, you know, I'm pro-champion, love my doctors, whatever, right? I'm on your side and on your team. But objectively, if I was happening to be an auditor on the payer side, I would be dinging you for all of these things, right? Because it doesn't follow or support reimbursement policy. So everything would just be gone. So you have to be fair as well and honest in your education feedback, 100%. Um, a payer would not look at it as kindly as we would, right? This is education because we want things cleaned up moving forward, right? Once I'm gone in two weeks, I expect all of the changes to start happening, right? Start implementing what I said um, so then when the payer comes back to audit you, everything is clean, everything is fixed up, right, based on our education, our talking to each other the weeks before, right? So that's, that's the goal. Um, it's not for us to penalize, it's to help educate. So moving forward, you can take these considerations at hand and, and make all of those implementations to, again, protect yourself in this new this new landscape that our physicians and APPs are definitely in. Um, and also what we always educate on is all of this was done to help you, right? Yeah. This is what the, the patients over paperwork initiative was about. It was about yeah. you. It was about helping you um, spend much more quality time with your patients rather than on this 
quote unquote paperwork, right? Um, it should not be so voluminous. We no. as auditors shouldn't have to be rifling through 75 pages for one date of service when you are not so sick in the inpatient, right? Setting, you are simply coming in for an office, this, that, or the other, right? It's not that serious of an issue, but there is something wrong with you, but not yeah. 75 pages worth of our reviewing of documentation. So think of it like that much more practically, um, that a patient, you yourself as a physician are a patient, right? And so you would never want to have that level of bloat for a service that you go in for on your own as well when you're not that that sick. Um, yeah. Have to think practically now as well because this whole initiative was done to reduce all of this nightmare that we were tortured with for decades, right? Um, yeah. It was a bad system and we're trying to clean it up. So, yep. yep. Yeah. And, and I, uh, when I do audits for my clients, um, I tell them that I do them as if I was the payor. So I tell them I, I'm not being nice through this, you know, and when I do my reports, I make comments about a payor may look at this yes. from this medical necessity because yes. that's how they need to see it and how they need to think. So for all of y'all that are in offices and practices and you do internal checks yourself, put that, put that thought in your head when you're looking at the records, you're not going to do your uh, physicians and APPs any service no. by looking at it and just going, Oh yeah, this is great. You know, look at it as if you were the right. payor right. and not wanting to pay it. You know, like, what would I look at this and is this ambi ambiguous and is this not clear? Mm -hmm. You know, give them that kind of feedback. That's what's going to help them the best. Exactly. That's really well said, right? And I think you and I touched on this on a previous session together. Um, it's absolutely true. When We always recommend that you do internal auditing, right? You look at your services once a month, see what's going on, right? Where is your weakness? We should all be doing that right now. It's 23. So things are brand new, right? There's a bunch of new CPT codes, a bunch of new guidelines. So nobody really knows what to do, right? So you should be internally auditing. But as she said earlier, when you're an internal auditor, you tend to favor your doctor, right? You tend to support them and not really look with a clean objective set of eyes, you know? So sometimes as a provider, you may want to reach out to have an external um, audit happen, right? By people who are much more objective, who really want to help you clean things up and not just um, let you continue to slide with the way things have, have been done. So yeah, that's the good point that I wanted to touch on. That Good. everybody is needed, but we need objectivity yes. when it comes to our auditing. Yeah. Uh, all right. We had another question um, that was on the FAQs there. If my providers asked to consult on the observation patient, should the office or other outpatient E&M codes be used to report this activity? And the reason why I pulled this question out is because of how it was answered. Um, now, remember, this was a question that was put to the AMA. So the AMA says, no, use consultation service codes 99252 to 99255, uh, because in the CPT book, these are now the inpatient or observation consultations. Um, but the issue with that would be, what if it's a Medicare patient? And Medicare, of course, doesn't accept the consultation codes. Um, you know, if you look at your Max site and look at their E&M stuff, like I was looking um, this this morning on Novitas or Novitas, I don't know which way they like to say it, Whatever, but yeah. they, they stayed on there, you know, like for, for observation, you know, they don't want you not only to not use consultation codes because they don't accept them anymore, but they don't want you to use the initial inpatient or observation care codes either, or right. the subsequent ones. They're telling people to use the office, office. other outpatient. And I think that's where that question came from, mm -hmm. um, is that she was thinking about that. That's why she asked, should we use right. the office other outpatient? That's really what I thought. But yeah. again, the AMA is going to answer 
Mm -hmm. as the AMA. So in right. their mind, we have consultation codes. So if anybody doesn't accept the consultation codes, that's when you fall back to this issue of how do I do it? So from a Medicare standpoint, you do have to use the office other outpatient codes for that. Exactly, Betty. Um, and I just wanted to circle back to the fact why I sent you all of the documents that you put mm -hmm. as links for our audience. You know, I thought it was really good guidance that everybody should have access to, right? I don't know if everybody in the audience has signed up for the AMA's materials, right? Um, but those FAQs have been updated, right? Since the new guidelines came out for the 23 stuff. So, you know, it's really, really important to not only look at our AMA, right? When it comes to all of our commercial things, right? Because the AMA does not you know, follow the Medicare stuff, right? They do their own thing. So like you just, you know, touched on, we have to also be looking at all of our MACs throughout the country that we happen to work in, right? Um, because all of them have published guidance on the new guidelines on their web pages, And the facts are clear from all of the MACs that they do not accept any of these consultation codes and they haven't for quite some time. Yeah. So we do really need to dig in to those multiple web pages as well and see what each and every Mac is asking for in that specific question, right? Circumstance, what do we do? Because these inpatient observation things are so brand new, um, you know, what does each region suggest mm -hmm. that we follow? So yeah, it's really important that we all use the published guidance that we have available to us and not just guess or try and use the outdated ways because those guidelines are gone. Yeah, right? well, so. our commercial payors too. I mean, the commercial payors, you know, sometimes they'll follow Medicare, sometimes they don't. So, you know, um, that's where, you know, at, at least I find with the max, they're better about having oh, those things published out there. You know, they absolutely, have to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Commercial payers sometimes kind of hide them. <laughs> you know, it's, they, they hide them all the time. No idea where to find on the site. Is it they, in this section, that section? You know, so sometimes it's a little rougher, um, but they could do whatever they want from payer to payor and from plan to plan. I so um, yeah. that's where it's, it's a lot going to be a lot tougher with some of those questions. Absolutely. And piggybacking off of what you just said, those commercial payers, if you happen to have a job function where you're the one that's picking up the phone and saying, you know, hey, Cigna, and they tell you that some representative that you're talking to says, I follow, we follow Medicare guidelines. But then you see published on the web, you know, a specific payer policy and they don't follow it at all. It's something of their own that they've constructed, you know? Yeah. So you have to be really careful with when you pick the phone and say, hey, Cigna, because you just don't know if that representative is saying what's true when you're looking at their webpage and it says something completely different. So yep. you really have to be very, very careful. I always ask them to email that to you, please. Yes, email, get everything in writing. Yes. Yep. Yes. Or ask them where on the website you can find that document. Exactly. Please that. show me. Yes. Please yeah. show me where I can find that support. Yes. Because yep. yeah, because if if y'all change what you're doing and then you get audited by that payor and they say, you know, well, no, and our policy that's right. published on the what they're not going to want to hear you say, well, uh, you know, the the person on the phone, well, who was it? You're who probably not going to remember because it was like right. six months ago, and right. you know, so yeah, all. Always, you need the hard copy stuff. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right. So here um, again, I, I picked this one because I oh, thought that they misinterpreted what the person was asking again. Now I might be totally wrong, but when I looked at these, I know I didn't think in the manner that it was answered. Okay. So the, the question was: um, the GP receives records from a new patient's cardiologist which included an EKG, a chest X-ray, and all the physician's notes. So they said, can the physician receive for reviewing the cardiologist's notes credit 
one unique source and the EKG and chest X-ray. Now to me, what they're asking is, can they get one point for reviewing the notes and another point for the EKG and chest X-ray? They're, they're asking like, can I unbundle these and count these multiple times? That's what I thought they were asking. The answer that they gave was yes, but when you read the answer, it says review of all materials from any unique source counts as one element toward MDM. So if they were asking what I thought they were asking, can you count this as two or three? The answer is no, because it's from one source, no matter how many pages it is, it's one element. Right. Yeah. So when you and I get questions, I, I see your point on how you read that question, because you and I have spoken offline all the time for forever on these multiple types of questions that we get. And there is so much nuance to question asking. Right. You can read it one way. I can read it another way. And then the AMA gives you that answer, right? But no, you're absolutely right in their answer, right? Our answer supports what they are saying. Absolutely true. But you cannot unbundle all of these items, right? Which is basically what that question was trying to do, right? No. So everything from that one unique source, you count as one. So of course, all of the labs, all of the you know chest X-rays, all of the MRIs, the doctor's notes, all of that, comprehensively, you can only count one time. It's coming from that one unique source. Um, but yeah, Betty and I get questions like that that are so complex, um, and you can see it multiple ways. But you really have to be able to filter in. Um, you know, what was the questioner act actually trying to ask? And absolutely, if you're trying to elevate, that's a no. Like, yeah. no. Yeah, and, and that's when I end up where people say, well, it's just a quick question. Yeah, it's, it's, never, a question. it's <laughs> never a quick question to a consultant, like ever. This question, never. You know, we could give three paragraphs back Correct. as an answer because it's Correct. like, if you meant this, right. then here. If you meant this, you know, so um, a, a lot of these things, yeah, you just, you could go off on so many different tangents for right. things that, Correct. you know, you can't tell. Yeah. Um, and another one we had here was about the inherent risks. So mm -hmm. the question was, do inherent risks, like perforation, mm -hmm. uh, perforation true. possibilities, that kind of stuff, make all surgeries high risk to patients when selecting the level of risk from medical decision making? Um, no, but I, I, the way I look at it when I, when I think through this is that it, it's kind of like, I liken it to prescription drug management. I, I, at least that's how I kind of think, like, if you just see a laundry list of drugs at the end of a note, that's not prescription drug management, right? No, you have to see that it says, continue on this dosage of whatever, or this dose is fine, or I'm upping this one, or they can stop this one. You have to see management. Management, yep. So it's the same kind of thing with risk. Just on every note, every time somebody has a procedure, if they say, told the patient about the risk, bleeding, blah, 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 and death, you know, because that always has to be thrown in there at the end. I love how that, that just sneaks in there, right? Um, and then it just goes on. That to me is the same thing as like just listing a bunch of drugs. You're just throwing it out there. What I look for is when it says, due to the patient's diabetes, mm -hmm. explain that, you know, they're at a higher risk for the wound not healing. So they're going to have mm -hmm. to keep an eye on it. Right. You know, so when, when I look at things like that for risk factors, like available to like, again, on the risk column, bump it up from maybe a low to a moderate or a moderate to a high. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, do you have comments on that one, Sonal? No, that's exactly how I see it. Um, I wrote an article for NamUs recently where I addressed something to that effect that our, in, in my 
opinion and in my experience of my surgeon's documentation that I've seen, they've always done a really, really good job of explaining much more of the risk that you and I want to see, right? They've already been doing a great job. Um, but in this new landscape, that's exactly, we don't want to see just the laundry list. Obviously, a surgery is always going to put you at risk, right? Anytime you're put under, there's a risk of you not coming out, right? So that's just going to be a given. We want much more for that particular patient, right? How is that patient at risk, right? It's much more about that as well. Um, so yeah, I completely agree with you that those types of things we need to see in the documentation um, yeah. to support the risk category to be elevated. Yeah, And you can't just elevate everything to a five because the patient is going under the knife. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and lady makes a good, you know, the key word is management. So that's kind of how I, like I said, I kind of liken the two in that manner that, you know, yes, it's got a risk, but how is it personalized to that specific patient? Right. You know, everything, that's what you have to drill yes, them down to. Yes. Everything in this new landscape is individualized to the patient. It's all about yep. the patient and the patient's yep. risk. Yep. Um, now, this is one of the questions that was sent to us, and I had to put it in two parts because it only takes 200 characters. So, so it says, so if the ER doctor sees the patient and admits him to observation mm -hmm. and then seen by another doctor of a different specialty, does the ER doctor append the 25 to the ER visit or is the other doctor appending the 25? And then the second part as it went on. Or is it saying if the ER doctor sees the patient and then that same ER doctor sees the patient again in observation, he appends the 25 modifier. So, Sonal, do you want to take that one or do you want me to do it first? Okay, so I think what this new guideline um, is intended for, right, is if a doctor sees the patient before somewhere else, like in the office, you know, and then they're going to send them off perhaps to be, be hospitalized, right? So in that situation, these new guidelines allow that physician for the office to append the modifier 25. Um, in this particular situation, she was talking about, or he was talking about the ER setting. Can you put that question up again for me? Mm-hmm. Okay, so if the ER doctor sees the patient and admits him to OBS, and then see, and, and then that patient is seen by another doctor of a different specialty, does the ER append? So she's asking she wants to append the ER visit, the 99281 or something, with a modifier 25? Yeah, I think what she's asking is if two different physicians see the patient on the same day, mm -hmm. one in the ED, one in observation, do they have to put a modifier 25 on their e &M codes? And the answer would be no, because they're different people, different specialties, don't have anything to do with each other. That's how I was reading what she was saying. Um, because especially with the different specialty issue. Right. It's a different point. specialty. Yeah. Right. But, you know, your point about the new guideline, you know, um, is if it's the same person doing the same thing, kind of, um, I, I think from an ER standpoint, you know, especially if it's um, inpatient, that kind of thing, they usually don't do, they don't do it. They don't right. do it. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't come up. Um, but the other thing about that modifier 25 thing to remember y'all is that Medicare is like, uh-uh. Right. You know, so they play their own <laughs> game. You can't right. do that with a Medicare patient. Right. Medicare still wants you to roll it together roll it. and build yep. on one thing. You exactly. know, they don't, they don't get on board with the whole modifier 25 issue. No, um, so yeah, in, in that case, two different doctors, different specialties, they just each bill their right. own they thing. Each to go. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, no, I saw, oh, this was one that, that uh, somebody put me on LinkedIn, but I think it's more of a, a diagnosis question. 
but my answer, I think we, we addressed this in, in a prior thing, it was kind of similar. So she had a patient that was in an observation setting, the provider was documenting pyelonephritis, but the discharge status uh, had no signs of pyelonephritis. Which one would you use? And my answer at that would be to query the provider. Right, for sure. You definitely have to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just didn't want the, the person that sent this in to think that I kind of ignored the question. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anytime you get things that are not clear or conflicting in note, always right. query the provider. Right. Because if it's conflicting for you, if a payor is looking at that, it's going to be the same thing. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Um, now, I did see somebody here put out a question here. Um, Sana. Uh, if a specialty physician recommends surgery, but the patient denies it, does that count in deciding the n level? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, based on our new guidelines, right, finally, they get credit for the consideration of management, right? So absolutely, that's going to affect yeah, remember when you look at when you look at the bullets under the risk, it's decision for surgery, not that they're going to have it or you schedule it. Right. You know, uh, same thing with medication. If the patient comes and they have like a funky rash, and the physician says or the APP says, you know, I want to give you this steroid, you know, prescription cream. And the patients all, you know, oh, no steroid, no, you know, I don't want to, even if it's a cream and they get all freaked out and they say no and they don't take it. Well, that's still what you said they needed, even though they refused it, that right. was still your decision making. So that's you right. still count it. That's you know, right. you just have to make sure they document that. Document that it. Patients document that know it. that they don't have it in there, make sure they say offered right. patient this and patient refused. So right. same thing, Sana, for this, if it says, recommended, you know, patient have their gallbladder out or they have this or that and the patient at this time refuses, right. that's your decision. So you would count it, would but count they it. have to document that. That's right. That's a great question. <laughs> like, and here, Teresa, yes, it's like the same with global days since CAFs have zero global, right? When you're looking at major and minor, it has major nothing minor to risks. do right. with right. the global right. days from Medicare, according yeah. to CPT, you know, right. um, and the cath is always the example I give. If you're putting stints in the heart and all that, I'm sorry, that has zero global days with Medicare, but that is not a minor procedure. Right, that's you know? not minor. No, no. So, yeah, um, yeah. so it, it behooves the, the physician to say, major procedure recommended, minor procedure. If you could get them into habit of saying that, that would be very, very helpful. Um, but that's, that's, that's a hard pull. Um, that's a hard that pull I because that's definitely a hard pull because they're not trained to write those words in their documentation, yeah. right? Major and minor. That I believe that's also up to us as the coding professionals to understand um, what the procedures are, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, now we're at time, but I have one more question that came in here that I think we How can is do it this quick. fast already? Oh my goodness. I know. Okay. What is your interpretation for escalation of care? So when they put it in there before it was um, for inpatient admission, that's when yeah. you would need it, right? But right. now since they've added inpatient codes in, it can't be just for inpatient admission if they're already an inpatient. Mm -hmm. Then you would never meet it if they were an inpatient. Right. So um, when you look at escalation of care, if they're on a regular floor and then they have a downturn and they go to the ICU, they go to ICU. That's escalation of care. That's escalation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Would you look at um, specialty floors also as being escalation? I just thought of that. You know, like if they're in a general bed and they move them to the cardiac unit. I, I would think so. I would consider that escalation of care. Um, yeah. And again, that all has to be documented. Absolutely. Yes. To be moved from a general section to the cardiac wing. Absolutely. That would be an escalation of care. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so, yes, and, and, and another thing, and that just brings out another point to consider is that y'all might want to add these things in your 
compliance program in your evaluation and management policies. You know, put these yes. things in there that are common yes. things that come up. Right. And then if a payor uh, audits y'all, you send that along with it. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, and then, oh, I'm seeing now people are asking questions. So this is another quick one, y'all. Sorry. If a patient denies prescription drugs and wants to get OTC drugs, does it still count in deciding the E&M level? Yes. Absolutely. That's yes. Right. So they said you need a prescription. Patient says, no, I want something over the counter. You still count it as prescription drug management. Absolutely. Because you considered it. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Good. All right. Well, yes, we are at the end of time. And once again, um, y'all were just getting started in here with asking <laughs> us questions. So maybe this E&M one, Sonal, maybe we can do it like quarterly or something yes, like that. Yes, I think we need to. Yes. And have people just so. send us stuff um, uh, yeah. because this seems to to get, you know, well attended and uh, lots of good questions. Start lots of come. amazing questions. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we just started on 23, right? And um things have changed. And so I think that's a great idea to do yeah. this from time oh, to time, course. just to see what people have to ask. Absolutely. Because I don't think we're, we're, you and I are, are even done yet, right? Talking. No. Yeah. Yeah. We still Digesting do that. all what of the changes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Great. And, and I just, as a last thing here, I am going to be speaking um, this Saturday at the Northwest, uh, Northwest Indiana Coders Spring Seminar. So I just thought I would put some information up here for that. And I'll put that in the chat too, if you want to go check that out. We're going to be doing um, a, a four hour seminar. Uh, well, four and a half is four and a half CEUs. And we're going to be talking about the differences between inpatient and outpatient coding, like so DRGs versus mm. CBT and the UB4 versus the CMS, CMS 1500, all that kind of stuff. So um, I put the link down in the chat if y'all want to go check that out or sign up for it. Um, it, it should be a, a, a good seminar. Um, but thank you so for joining me again today. And you. don't forget, y'all, we have coming up, not the next time, because I have Rosemann next, but the one after that, Sonal's back on, and we're going to do our part two for the audits when we talk about actually doing the audit. That's right. right. Can't wait. So that'll be a Looking good one. Looking forward to it. Yep. So exactly. watch for those notices coming up. And um, again, make sure you're checking Sonal out on um, her podcasting, Paint the Medical Picture. Um, yes. And the medical her picture LinkedIn, podcast. you know, where her SP Collaborative, her new venture is. Um, here is her uh, link. You can find her on LinkedIn under her company and under herself. You know, so make sure y'all are connecting with both of us and uh, follow us so that you see all the stuff we always are throwing out there uh, <laughs> to kind of get everybody talking about stuff. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for joining us today, especially you, my friend, Sonal. Again, I appreciate you. Uh, and um, so y'all have a good rest of the day and weekend and join us next time to see what's happening in healthcare, And we will take it from there and just keep moving forward. See y'all. Thanks, Betty. Bye.